It was the Christmas season of 1959 when the Walker family, a happy family of four, went out to run some errands. Christine, the caring mother, decided to come home early to cook a warm dinner for her family while they were still out. But as soon as she stepped inside, she was met with an unknown intruder. This intruder went on to abuse Christine and then shot her, leading to her tragic death. Moments later, her husband Cliff arrived home with their little ones, three-year-old Jimmy and one-year-old Debbie. What should have been a joyful reunion quickly turned into a nightmare. Cliff was ambushed and shot without warning, leaving the innocent children defenseless. Jimmy was shot next, and it was reported that he crawled to his father as the killer fired bullet after bullet into his head. Little Debbie faced an even more horrific fate. After being shot, she was drowned in the family bathtub. This case remains unsolved to this day, but thanks to new technology, we might finally be getting closer to uncovering what really happened to the Walker family. Interestingly, this mystery is also linked to another well-known crime from the same year, a case that shaped the true crime genre as we know it. So, if you're curious about who might be responsible for this horrific tragedy, let's dig in and find out more. The story of the Walker family begins in the quiet town of Osprey, located in Sarasota County, Florida. With a population of just over 6,000 people, Osprey was a small, peaceful place where everyone seemed to know each other. Cliff Walker and Christine first met at Arcadia High School, where their personalities couldn't have seemed more different yet fit together perfectly. Cliff was a tall, wiry cowboy known for his love of cool cigarettes. He rarely drank, but his friends could always count on him to be hardworking and dependable. Christine, on the other hand, was full of energy and charm. With her curly light brown hair and bright smile, she was the outgoing flirty drum major who turned heads wherever she went. And despite having many admirers, Christine fell for Cliff, and the two quickly became inseparable. They married young, with Christine at 19 and Cliff at 20. In the five years that followed, their family grew, welcoming two children, Jimmy and Debbie, into their lives. Life was simple but joyful for the Walkers. They lived in a small white wood frame house nestled at the end of a winding shell road on Potter Palmer Ranch, a massive property spanning over 14,000 acres. Cliff worked on the ranch as a cow handler, a tough but rewarding job. Their house was modest but felt warm and welcoming, and the Walkers made it a loving home. The ranch was far from crowded, with their closest neighbors living a full mile away, giving them a quiet space to raise their little ones. Though Cliff made a steady income as a ranch hand, they weren't as financially comfortable as some of their friends and family. Money wasn't plentiful, but the Walkers valued the simple joys, quiet evenings, shared meals, and watching their two young children grow. Now, life on the ranch meant early mornings for the Walker family. Most days, the home would already be stirring with activity at dawn, as Cliff would prepare for a long day's work and Christine managed the busy mornings with the children. That's why, when a family friend named Don McLeod arrived at their house early on the morning of December 20, 1959, he expected to find the walkers up and about, maybe even getting ready for a busy day ahead. But instead, he was met with an unsettling silence. Thinking maybe Cliff had just overslept, Don knocked loudly on the back door. When no one answered, he tried again, each knock a little louder than the last. By the time he'd knocked several times with no response, worry began to set in. Finally, feeling something was truly wrong, Don made a difficult choice to cut the screen door, unhook the latch, and enter the silent home. Stepping into the dark kitchen, he switched on the light, hoping he'd find a simple explanation for the strange stillness. But what Don saw next was beyond anything he could have imagined. Just inside the doorway to the living room, he spotted Christine's feet. She was barefoot, lying on the floor, her dress pulled up around her waist. Christine, just 24 years old, had been killed by a gunshot to the head, a wound inflicted by a 22 caliber weapon. As Don looked further into the room, his heart sank even more. 
Cliff was lying on his back, still wearing his cowboy hat. Next to him was their little son, three-year-old Jimmy, lying close to his dad. Both had been shot in the head with the same weapon. The blood on the floor showed that Jimmy had crawled toward his father, possibly trying to seek comfort in his last moments. Debbie, the walker's two-year-old daughter, was missing from where the rest of her family lay. Alarmed and horrified, he ran out of the house, jumped in his car, and drove a mile to the nearest payphone to call the police. Investigators arrived quickly, and as they searched the house, they made a heartbreaking discovery. Debbie was in the bathroom, lying in the bathtub. She had suffered a gunshot wound, but her actual cause of death was drowning. By the way, I post true crime and new cases here every day. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing. It helps a lot. Now, when this tragic murder took place, the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office faced an uphill battle. They had no suspects to go on, so they combed through the house, searching for any clues that might reveal who was behind this horrific crime. However, the Sheriff's Office was small, underfunded, and didn't have enough resources to properly handle such a complex case. As a result, mistakes were made right from the start. Deputies from nearby counties came to help, bringing along bloodhounds, fingerprint experts, and ballistic specialists. Yet, despite this extra assistance, there were still major obstacles. Sarasota County didn't even have a camera to capture the scene, so news photographers had to be brought in to take crime scene photos, a crucial task usually reserved for investigators to prevent contamination. The presence of so many people coming and going likely disturbed key evidence. For instance, any tire tracks from unfamiliar vehicles could have been destroyed by all the extra activity near the property. However, investigators did find some chilling details connected to the murder. It seemed that Christine was the attacker's first victim and she put up a fierce fight. She had used her high-heeled shoe to defend herself, leaving traces of her attacker's blood on it. But even with her efforts, the intruder overpowered her, assaulted her, and took her life. Strangely, it looked as though her body had been moved and arranged in the living room afterward, almost as if staged by the killer. While combing through the scene, investigators also found unknown DNA evidence on Christine's clothing, a potential clue pointing to the attacker's identity. And fortunately enough, no similar signs of assault or struggle were found on the other family members. Additionally, several strange items were missing from the Walker's home after the tragedy. Cliff's pocket knife, Christine's old high school majorette uniform, and even their marriage license. These weren't items a typical burglar would think to take, so police felt they could be clues. They also found disturbing signs left behind, and those are a bloody cowboy boot print on the floor, a partial fingerprint on the bathtub, some spent bullet casings believed to be from the murder weapon, and a cigarette wrapper of a brand no one in the Walker family smoked. In an odd twist, months after the murders, three local women stumbled across a pile of bloody clothing in a nearby shed. Among the items were two shirts, a skirt, a blouse, pants, and a handkerchief, all belonging to Cliff and Christine. Investigators believed the killer had used these clothes to wipe off blood before leaving the scene. All these clues led detectives to believe that the killer might have been someone familiar to the walkers. For one, Christine hadn't parked in her usual spot in the driveway that day, hinting that someone else might have already been there. Even more unsettling was that the family's three dogs hadn't barked at the intruder. These dogs usually barked at anyone unfamiliar so their silence suggested that whoever came into the Walker home that day wasn't a stranger to them. And to really understand why Christine was the first victim, investigators interviewed friends and family, gathering details about the Walker's last day on December 19, 1959. This was just six days before Christmas, so the family of four headed out around four in the afternoon to run a few errands. They picked up cigarettes, sodas, candy, and cattle feed. Christine drove home in the family's 1952 Plymouth, arriving about 30 minutes before Cliff and the kids who came later in his Jeep. 
Cliff had been considering a trade for a 1956 Chevrolet Bel Air with a green and white two-tone finish. And it's possible he was out checking on cars that day. It's possible that's why he and Christine were separated, allowing her to get home just a bit before him. Christine barely had time to hang her purse and put away the groceries before she was ambushed. Police believe that Cliff and the children arrived while the killer was still there, catching them off guard, and that's why they too became victims. One of the biggest challenges for the investigation was that there were simply too many suspects. Detectives interviewed an overwhelming 587 people, which made it hard to narrow down who, if anyone, had a real connection to the murders. And after diving deep into the investigation and examining all the suspects, we've put together a list of the most intriguing names without any particular order. Starting with Curtis McCall, at the time of these tragic events, Curtis was just 21 years old and had a past with Christine Walker. They had dated back in high school, and rumors suggested that they might have rekindled their relationship shortly before her death. This connection immediately made him a person of interest in the case. What stood out about Curtis was that he owned a 22 caliber pistol, the very same type of weapon used in the murders. Interestingly, locals also painted him as a troublemaker, describing him as a no-good sort of guy who was always stirring up trouble. And according to rumors, after the murders, Curtis's demeanor changed noticeably. He became extremely anxious and lost a lot of weight, leading many to wonder if the weight of his actions was starting to catch up with him. It's also important to point out that Curtis had a history of violence. In fact, he had been fired from his job as a dispatcher for the Florida Highway Patrol after an incident where he attacked a man during a traffic stop. His fellow officers had to step in to prevent the situation from escalating, and surprisingly, Curtis didn't even remember what had happened. The investigation led authorities to track Curtis down to the Sumner County Courthouse in Georgia, where he was working as a construction foreman at the time. During questioning, he claimed he and Christine were never involved romantically, but he did recall seeing her a few weeks before the murders. Christine and her husband, Cliff, had stopped by his place to ask about a horse he was selling. This detail seemed innocent enough, but it showed he was still connected to the couple. When questioned about his 22 caliber pistol, Curtis admitted he once owned one but insisted that he had sold it to someone, although he couldn't recall who that was. This inconsistency raised more eyebrows among investigators, and to get to the bottom of things, he underwent a polygraph test to determine his honesty. Initially, he appeared nervous, which could suggest he had something to hide. However, in subsequent tests, he seemed more at ease, and the results indicated that he was telling the truth about most of his statements. But there was a catch. When asked if he withheld any information during the questioning, the polygraph results were less clear. It suggested that he might not have been entirely truthful about certain details, leaving investigators wondering what he might be hiding. And as of today, no one knew if Curtis was still alive or what had happened to him. Next is Wilbur Tooker, Tooker was a 65-year-old retired railroad worker who lived just a mile southwest of the Walkers. He was once a familiar face in their home, dropping by often to chat and share stories. But his visits took a troubling turn as his behavior became more inappropriate, creating tension and discomfort within the family. It was reported that Christine Walker found herself increasingly uneasy around Tooker. She confided in her mother about her fears expressing how much she dreaded being near him. This was not just a passing concern. It was a deep-rooted fear that Tooker might cross boundaries that no one should ever cross. Several family members and friends later recalled incidents where Tooker had tried to kiss Christine or even coax her into bed. His actions were persistent enough that Christine felt she had to tell her husband, Cliff, about them. So, obviously, Cliff was furious when he heard what Tooker had been doing. He wanted to confront the older man and put an end to it. But Christine, worried about potential trouble, persuaded him to hold back. Even so, Cliff made it clear to Tooker that he was no longer welcome in their home and warned him not to come around anymore. Unfortunately, 
that warning seemed to fall on deaf ears. In the aftermath of the Walker family's tragic fate, Tooker's behavior raised even more suspicions. His friend, William Hosmer, revealed that Tooker was angry with Christine after her death, constantly talking about her in a way that made others uncomfortable. This strange obsession only added to the unsettling nature of Tooker's character. He often visited the Walker home, claiming he was gathering evidence to protect himself, which only fueled the investigation into his actions. On the day of the murders, detectives retraced Tooker's movements. He had gone out to dinner with a friend from around 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., but there was a significant gap in his timeline. Between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m., just when the walkers were brutally murdered, Tooker had no solid alibi. After dinner, he showed up at Bradenton High School by 7.45 p.m. to play the violin with the school orchestra. Investigators spoke with his fellow musicians to see if they noticed anything strange about Tooker that evening, but no one could confirm any odd behavior. Sadly, Tooker passed away in March 1963, leaving behind a trail of questions and an unsettling feeling surrounding the Walker family's tragic fate. Then we have Elbert Walker, who happened to be Cliff's cousin. From the very beginning, Elbert's reaction to the tragic death of the Walker family raised eyebrows. At the funeral, he didn't just shed a few tears, he wailed loudly, almost as if he were putting on a performance. It got so intense that he fainted and had to be carried out of the service. This dramatic display left many family members feeling uneasy, leading them to suspect that Elbert was simply faking his grief for attention. Some even told investigators that he was putting on a show to draw focus to himself. Elbert had a reputation for being wild, especially when he drank. Family members whispered that he secretly had feelings for Christine, which made his behavior all the more suspicious. After the funeral, his actions only added fuel to the fire of suspicion. Whenever anyone mentioned the crime, Elbert would suddenly leave the room, refusing to engage in conversations about the tragedy that had befallen his family. Growing up, Elbert and Cliff were close. In fact, Elbert had even lived with the Walker family for a time after separating from the military, which made his sudden withdrawal from discussions about the murders seem all the more troubling. When investigators decided to question Elbert, he cooperated fully, undergoing a polygraph test, which he passed. However, on the day the bodies were discovered, Elbert claimed he had come to Osprey from Washula to discuss a Christmas party that Cliff was supposedly planning. Investigators later learned this story was untrue, as Cliff had not planned any party and was actually going to Arcadia for the holidays. When Elbert arrived in Osprey that day, he dropped off a friend at the Ohio bar before heading to a nearby gas station, where he approached two men. One of the men noticed that Elbert's eyes were red and thought he looked like he had a rough night. Elbert asked, do you know where Cliff Walker lives? This question struck them as strange because Elbert had lived at the Walker's house for months after leaving the military in 1958. He was familiar with the area and had attended many family cookouts and gatherings. One of the men at the gas station eventually told Elbert the heartbreaking news. The Walker family had been murdered. When Elbert arrived at the Walker home, he acted as if he had just heard the news for the first time. He sobbed uncontrollably, leaning over the hood of Christine's parked car, burying his head in his arms. In September of 1962, investigators revisited their focus on Elbert, tracking him down in Ridgely, Tennessee, where he was working as a migrant farm worker. They first spoke with Elbert's 17-year-old girlfriend, Johnny Rainey, and her brother. They revealed that although Elbert often talked about the rest of the Walker family, he had never mentioned Christine. Johnny said that Elbert appeared visibly disturbed when he talked about Cliff, while her brother noted that Elbert was crying like a baby as he spoke about Debbie, Cliff's daughter, being drowned in the bathtub. Elbert had even told him that Jimmy, Cliff's son, didn't die immediately because he crawled up to his daddy and died. This detail raised eyebrows among investigators, as there were no reports mentioning Jimmy crawling, only that he had died huddled next to his father. 
Elbert was questioned and hooked up to a polygraph machine, which he passed. However, in 1987, Lieutenant Max Skeens, the polygraph expert for the sheriff's office, expressed doubts about the reliability of old polygraphs. He explained that technology had significantly improved since then, and training back in the day was often minimal. During a meeting about the Walker case, detectives brought in Ellis Denham, an expert who had dedicated much of his career to solving the case. They asked him who his top suspect had been before he retired in 1975. Without hesitation, Denham replied, Elbert Walker. After this revelation, detectives brought Elbert to the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office and connected him to the latest polygraph machine. Once again, Elbert passed the test and Lieutenant Dario Valente, who was part of the investigation, concluded in his report that Elbert Walker is not responsible for the Walker murders. He added that Elbert had been extremely cooperative and appreciated the ongoing concern regarding the investigation. Despite passing the polygraph tests and maintaining his innocence, Valente noted that this wouldn't be the last time Elbert would be questioned about the murders. Fifteen years from now, somebody is going to come along and probably do everything that we did all over again, Valente predicted. Next, we have Butch Dennison. A woman came forward to the police and claimed that Dennison had boasted about killing the walkers. According to her, he said his father helped him cover it up by burying his cowboy boots, which allegedly had blood from the walkers on them. Butch's father passed a polygraph exam. However, there is no indication that Butch was ever questioned in relation to the Walker murders. Then there's the meter reader, Stanley Mock. Stanley Mock left his Brinks Avenue home to read meters for the electric company. He exchanged pleasantries with some families whose homes were on his route and played golf in his spare time. But a troubled mind lurked behind his everyman exterior. Before the Walker murders, he enlisted the help of a psychiatrist to quash an uncontrollable urge to kill his wife and two small children. From the beginning of the Walker investigation, detectives were drawn to Stanley, eager to solve the case. They discovered he had also been linked to another mysterious crime that had occurred a few months earlier. A young University of Florida student named Chandler Steffens had been found dead in his apartment, tied up, tortured, and left for dead in a gruesome scene that became known as the Mummy Murder. As the detectives dug deeper, they learned that Stanley's meter route included the very apartment complex where Steffens had lived. The coincidences piled up when they found out he also read the meter for the Walker House. Yet, despite the unsettling connections, investigators never uncovered any concrete evidence to link him to either crime. In a recent interview, Mary Mock, Stanley's widow, revealed how her husband had been deeply affected by the Walker family's deaths. He had known the children and felt a special bond with them during his meter readings. The news of their brutal murder shattered him. When he saw it in the paper in 1959, it just about killed him, she recalled, explaining how he would often wander the streets at night, overcome with grief. Following the murders, Stanley suffered a complete breakdown and underwent electroshock therapy. His fear of hurting his own family haunted him, leaving him anxious and shaken during his work. Though Mary never knew her husband had been considered a suspect in the Walker case, she firmly believed in his innocence. I'm positive, in my heart, he could never do something like that, she said, defending the man she knew and loved. There are also reports suggesting that a man named Emmett Monroe Spencer confessed to the murders of the Walker family. However, Sarasota County Sheriff Ross Boyer quickly discredited Spencer's confession, labeling him a pathological liar. The sheriff revealed that Spencer's claims were not genuine. Instead, they appeared to be cleverly constructed from real murders he had read about in newspapers and true crime novels he enjoyed. In an intriguing twist in 1994, a bartender from Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, reached out to the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office with a tip. She claimed that one of her customers had boasted about killing the Walker family. Unfortunately, this lead was never verified, and to this day the case remains open. However, perhaps the most infamous figures potentially connected to this tragedy 
are Richard Hickok and Perry Smith, the notorious duo involved in the Clutter family murders, which gained significant attention in Truman Capote's book, In Cold Blood. If you've read this gripping book, you might remember a part that connects to the Walker family, highlighting eerie similarities between the two cases. The Clutter family was brutally killed by Hickok and Smith in Holcomb, Kansas in 1959, just 34 days before the Walker family met a similar fate. If you want to dive deeper into the details of this case, we have another video on it, and the link will be in the description box below. What ties these two cases together is that, after killing the Clutter family, Smith and Hickok escaped to Florida in a stolen car. They were spotted at least a dozen times between Tallahassee and Miami. The pair checked into a motel in Miami Beach, about four hours away from Osprey, and left the morning of the Walker murders. On that same day, they shopped at a department store in Sarasota, just a few miles from the Walker home. One witness noted that the taller man had a scratched face. The duo was arrested in Las Vegas, Nevada on December 30, 1959 for the Clutter murders, and they were executed by hanging on April 14, 1965. Although a polygraph test seemed to clear them of the Walker murders, some experts argue that the machines from the early 60s were often unreliable. The sheriff's office acknowledged that Hickok and Smith were considered suspects as early as 1960. Records show that the Walkers were looking to buy a 1956 Chevrolet Bel Air, which matched the stolen car that Smith and Hickok were using in Florida. This raises the possibility that they entered the Walker home under the pretense of selling the car. In December 2012, investigators in Sarasota County announced plans to exhume the bodies of Smith and Hickok from Mount Muncie Cemetery. They hoped to extract mitochondrial DNA from the bones to compare with semen found at the Walker home. The bodies were exhumed and DNA was collected. Kansas authorities stated they would prioritize processing the DNA from active cases, which could take weeks or even months. By August 2013, the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office announced that they found no match between the DNA of either Perry Smith or Richard Hickok and the samples from the Walker murder. Only partial DNA was retrieved, possibly due to degradation or contamination over the years, leaving the outcome uncertain. Therefore, Smith and Hickok remain the prime suspects. However, based on the stolen items, Catherine Ramsland, a forensic psychologist, believes it's unlikely they were the killers and suspects that the murderer knew at least one member of the Walker family. With all that being said, it seems like a crazy coincidence that these two notorious family murders were in the exact same place at the same time. But then, if you consider the personal items that went missing, like the marriage certificate and Christine's drum uniform, it makes no sense for a stranger to want these items unless they were taken as trophies. Yet, they weren't found on Hickok and Smith when they were arrested. And the family loved them. Everyone seemed blissfully happy. Rachel set up a website, Neil and Rachel, and she was constantly updating people on how perfect her life was and how beautiful her baby was and how handsome her husband was. They say you can choose your friends, but family is forever. Or is it? Neil and Whistle had everything. A devoted wife, a baby daughter, and a serene home in Massachusetts. But in one terrifying instant, that family bond was broken in ways no one could have imagined. What really happened to the perfect life he seemed to have? This case has captured the attention of true crime documentaries, popular YouTube videos, and even a gripping book, with jurors calling it a story of unimaginable and unforgivable family murders. And by the end of this video, you'll understand why. On January 22, 2006, Neil Entwistle left his home around 9 in the morning to run some errands for his wife and their beautiful daughter. But when he returned, his world turned upside down. He discovered that both his wife and daughter had been shot dead, and he had no clue who could have done such a terrible thing. Neil claimed he was so heartbroken upon seeing the bodies that he considered taking his own life. 
but when it came to actually ending it all with a knife, he just couldn't go through with it. Instead, he hopped into the family car and drove over to his mother-in-law's house to get a 22 caliber revolver. Unfortunately, the house was locked up tight, so he told the police he decided to fly back home to England to see his parents. The news hit everyone hard. Friends and family described the Entwistles as a loving and friendly family with no known enemies. So the big question on everyone's mind was, who could have killed them? There was no sign of a break-in. Um, there was no sign of, of theft. Valuable items were laying around and none of which were touched. To get a clearer picture, let's take a closer look at this couple. Neil Entwistle and Rachel Entwistle had been married for three years, but their journey together started long before that. They first met while Neil was studying at the University of York, where he was working hard to earn a master's degree in electronic engineering. Growing up in Worksop, Neil lived with his parents, Clifford and Yvonne, and his younger brother, Russell. Their family was solidly working class, with his dad toiling as a coal miner and his mom cooking in the school canteen. Now, life in Worksop was pretty typical for a coal mining town, and while Neil and Russell had a normal childhood, Neil often felt a little embarrassed about their background. He dreamed of a fancier life, something that felt just out of reach. In fact, Neil had always been shy and often battled feelings of inadequacy, especially when it came to his Cockney accent at university. But everything changed when he met Rachel Souza. Born on December 14, 1978, in Weymouth, Massachusetts, Rachel had her own story. She lost her father, Paul, when she was young, which shaped her into a strong and determined person. Interestingly, Neil and Rachel met at the same university because Rachel had applied for a study abroad program at the University of York, the same place where Neil was working hard to earn his master's degree. As Neil and Rachel got to know each other, they found a special connection that made them feel like they could take on the world. They fell in love, with Neil often declaring that Rachel was the one, the person he wanted to spend his life with. After graduating, Rachel is also determined to start a new chapter with Neil. They settled in Redditch, about 15 miles south of Birmingham, where Neil landed a job with a computer company. Rachel found her passion teaching English and theater at St. Augustine's Catholic School. Going back, Rachel and Neil's wedding took place on August 10, 2003, at the Second Parish Church of Plymouth in Massachusetts, a beautiful day marking the beginning of their life together. Fast forward two years, and on April 9, 2005, they welcomed their daughter, Lillian, into the world. Everything seemed perfect, and those who knew Neil and Rachel personally often described them as a cute, loving family. Rachel thrived at St. Augustine's, where she formed close bonds with her fellow teachers and students. Outside of work, she built a solid circle of friends and a vibrant community, always bringing warmth and laughter to those around her. But for Neil, things weren't as rosy. He struggled to find his footing in this new life. Weighed down by insecurities about his working class roots and his thick work sop accent, he felt like an outsider. No matter where he went, he couldn't shake the nagging feeling that everyone was judging him for how he spoke and where he came from. This internal battle held him back from pursuing better opportunities in England, leaving him feeling trapped in a life that didn't fully reflect who he wanted to be. Feeling insecure and ready for a change, Neil was on the lookout for a fresh start, maybe even a chance to find his true calling. So he suggested that they pack up and move to Rachel's home state of Massachusetts, and while Rachel loved her job and had made some great friends in Redditch, the idea of being closer to her mom and stepdad Priscilla and Joe excited her. With little Lillian in the mix, she couldn't wait for her parents to play a bigger role as grandparents. When it came time to move, Neil told his job he had some personal stuff to figure out and that heading to the States was the best way to keep Rachel happy. But here's the catch, he didn't tell anyone not even Rachel, that he had actually quit his job. Instead, he let her and her family think he was still working remotely for the computer company. And after making the big move back to Massachusetts, Neil and Rachel started spending more time with her family. 
One day at a family gathering, Neil went shooting with Rachel's stepdad, Joe, and her brothers. Joe pulled out the lockbox where he kept his guns, and while Joe and the brothers picked theirs out, Neil, being inexperienced, opted for the smallest gun, a 22 caliber revolver. It was his first time shooting a gun since moving. Although Neil and Rachel were living with her parents, they were eager to find their own place. They set their sights on a house in Hopkinton, a town famous for being the starting point of the Boston Marathon. The house, located at Six Cubs Path, was in a quiet cul-de-sac and had four bedrooms, three and a half baths, and a spacious 2,400 square feet, perfect for their little family. As mentioned, Neil wasn't bringing in any money. So how were they going to afford this dream home? Well, Neil managed to convince the owner to let them rent it on a short-term three-month lease for $2,700, plus an upfront payment of $5,400 for the first and last month's rent. He told the owner he was just waiting for his offshore accounts to transfer to the US so they could buy the house. Around this time, Rachel tried to use one of Neil's credit cards only to find it was frozen. After that incident, she confronted Neil about their finances, but he refused to answer her questions. By this point, Neil had piled up about $40,000 in credit card debt. Obsessed with living an upper-class lifestyle, Neil wanted to shake off the humble beginnings he grew up with and be seen as part of the elite. This desire pushed him to come up with some pretty questionable ways to make money. He spent a lot of time creating scam websites that promised people they could get rich quick with pyramid schemes. One of these sites, called millionmaker.co.uk, claimed participants could earn $6,000 a month within the first six months of signing up, charging a $90 setup fee and $25 a month for support for people running online adult businesses. Neil's second venture was a company called Embedded New Technologies Limited. The website had no products or services listed but had Neil as the main contact. Then there was Senior Publications, which promised earnings of $20,000 a month by spending only a couple of hours a week online. The ad didn't specify what was being sold, but charged $60 to join. He also created a porn site that featured barely legal women and even had a site advertising penis enlargement methods. On top of that, he seemed to have an online gambling issue. Court records later showed that in the month before Rachel and Lillian's deaths, he lost hundreds of dollars on a gambling site called Casino One, which was run by a company based in Gibraltar. To make matters worse, Neil was selling CD-ROMs of his get-rich-quick schemes on eBay, calling them business manuals. But around 2006, he started taking people's money without delivering the CDs. This got him in hot water with eBay, which ended up shutting down his account and launching an investigation. While Neil was busy scamming people online, Rachel was focused on settling into their new home. She was unpacking boxes and getting everything organized for a visit from her old college friends. Rachel wanted everything to be perfect for her friend's visit, so she was working hard to get the house in order. Between unpacking and taking care of Lillian, she was totally wiped out by the end of the day. After putting Lillian to bed, Rachel would head off to sleep, leaving Neil with plenty of time to himself. During that same week, Neil's Google search history was very alarming. He looked up things like quick suicide methods, best way to kill someone, and knife and neck kill. He even found an online forum where someone suggested it was better to stab someone just below the rib cage instead of going for the aorta, and he didn't stop there. Neil was also busy online searching for escort services. On January 16th, he checked out Adult Friend Finder and another site called halfpriceescorts.com. Just two days later, he was looking for escorts in Westboro. Then, on January 18th, he logged back into both Adult Friend Finder and halfpriceescorts.com again. He even downloaded a map for Blonde Beauty Escort Services in Worcester, which is about half an hour from Hopkinton, but that wasn't all. Neil also searched for flights to the UK on sites like flymanchester.com, lastminute.com, British Airways, and Manchester Airport. It was pretty clear he had a lot going on in his mind. 
On January 20, 2006, Neil left the house that morning, telling Rachel he was going to the mall to pick up some computer stuff. But that was a total lie. Instead, he went to his in-law's house, which was empty at the time. Using a spare key, he let himself in and headed straight for the box where Joe kept his guns. He took out the .22 revolver, the same one he had shot for the first time not long ago. After grabbing the gun, he returned home, where Rachel was upstairs in their bedroom with Lillian. Although it's never been confirmed what exactly happened, authorities believe Rachel and Lillian were in the primary bedroom when Neil came in with the revolver. At this point, it was clear that the person behind the shocking murder wasn't just a stranger, he was someone who had been part of their lives for years. Reports say that Rachel was holding little Lillian when Neil turned the gun on them. Rachel took a bullet to the head, and Lillian was shot in the abdomen, with the bullet also hitting Rachel right under her breast. That evening, Rachel's friends, who she had been so excited to see, showed up at the house. When no one answered the door, worry set in. They called Rachel's phone, and to their dismay, they could hear it ringing inside the house. Then they spotted a note from Priscilla, Rachel's mom, which only made them more anxious. Feeling something was really wrong, they called Priscilla and rushed to the Hopkinton police station to report Rachel missing. A couple of patrol officers at the station decided to check on the ent whistles. When they arrived at the house, they noticed that all the windows and doors were locked. One of the officers cleverly used a card from his wallet to unlock the front door. Inside, they found the TV still on and the family dog, Sally, a basset hound, barking from her crate. At first, the officers worried that the family might have been affected by a carbon monoxide leak, but seeing Sally alive put that thought to rest. As they made their way upstairs, the officers heard classical music coming from what they guessed was Lillian's room. They also noticed a bathtub full of cold water, suggesting someone had been getting ready for a bath. In the master bedroom, the bed looked like it had been slept in, with sheets and comforters tossed carelessly. Still, no one was home. Noticing that the family car was missing from the garage, the officers ran the license plate to check if it had been involved in any accidents. That day, they didn't find anything suspicious. The authorities figured that maybe the ent whistles had to rush out for some emergency since the plates were still on the table and there was no blood or anything strange around. But the friend who was worried about Rachel refused to leave without getting some answers. Even though it was freezing outside, she and her sister, who was also Rachel's friend, decided to park their car right in front of the Ent Whistle house and spend the night there. They had been warned not to go inside to avoid messing with any potential evidence. The next day, the patrol officers returned for another search of the house. This time, as they walked in, they were hit by a terrible smell. Following the stench upstairs, they made their way to the master bedroom, where the odor grew stronger. One officer decided to lift the covers on the bed, a crucial step they hadn't taken the day before. To their horror, he discovered a woman's foot. Pulling back the covers fully revealed the lifeless bodies of Rachel and Lillian. The officers quickly called for backup and the medical examiner, turning the ent whistle home into a crime scene. Meanwhile, the family's white BMW was located at the airport, with the keys still in the ignition. That same day, Rachel's parents received a call from Neil's father, Clifford. He shared that Neil had called him the day before, claiming he found Rachel and Lillian dead when he returned home from the mall. In a state of panic, Neil said he called the police and then drove to their house, but neither Priscilla nor Joe was home at the time. Clifford expressed his concern, saying Neil was distraught and had decided to catch a flight back. But the bizarre events didn't stop there. After hanging up with Clifford, Rachel's parents received a call from Neil himself. He told Joe a story similar to Cliff's, but conveniently left out mentioning that he called the police, likely because Joe would know that no one had done that the day before. On the 23rd of January, 2006, Neil received a call from Massachusetts State Police Sergeant Robert Manning. It was bold of Manning to reach out to Neil, and even bolder for Neil to stay on the line for nearly two hours. When Manning delivered the devastating news that his family was dead, 
Neil simply replied, I know, leaving Manning in stunned silence. My goal for the whole conversation was to obtain as much information as I could. Throughout the conversation, Neil recounted a version of events that mirrored what he and Clifford had told Joe, insisting that no one would have known Rachel and Lillian were home alone. Manning probed Neil's actions, questioning why he hadn't contacted the police or reached out to Priscilla or Joe after discovering the bodies. Neil explained that he didn't have their work numbers and had gotten lost trying to find Priscilla. Then, in a troubling revelation, he shared that after finding Rachel and Lillian, he had wanted to end his own life. Manning pressed him for details, asking why he felt that way. Neil replied that he simply wanted to be with his wife and daughter. He mentioned planning to retrieve a 22 pistol to take his life, but authorities suspected he actually intended to return the gun he had used to kill them, knowing that Rachel's parents would be at work. In another call with Manning, Neil explained he left the keys in the ignition of his BMW at the airport because he didn't think he would need them. When Manning asked if he planned to return to the US, Neil reportedly replied, I don't know, why would I do that? He also contacted the landlord of his rental house, saying he no longer had interest in it and requested his security deposit back, talking about Rachel and Lillian's belongings as if it were business as usual. A couple of weeks later, services were held for Rachel and Lillian, but Neil did not return for them. One day, authorities got a tip that Neil had left a friend's house in Scotland and was on a train. Fearing he was trying to go into hiding, they stopped the train and arrested him. During the arrest, they found a news clipping about escort services, and it was later revealed that Neil had been browsing escort sites in the days following Rachel and Lillian's deaths. Back in the US, a judge issued an arrest warrant for Neil. When he waived his rights to extradition, he was quickly brought back. Soon after his return, Neil began changing his story. He claimed that when he found Rachel and Lillian, he immediately thought it was a murder-suicide. He said he found Joe's 22 revolver near the bodies and believed Rachel had killed Lillian before taking her own life. This time, he said he returned the revolver to the Mozo house and put it back in the lockbox. Neil claimed he didn't call the police because he wanted to protect Rachel's honor, not wanting anyone to know she had killed Lillian and herself. This twist in his story was not only a blatant lie, but also deeply insulting to Rachel. Her family was horrified at the suggestion that Rachel could do something so horrific. They couldn't believe Neil would stoop so low, especially when his story was not just a self-preserving lie, it was also physically impossible. Authorities confirmed that Rachel had been holding Lillian when they were shot, and the length of the gun made it impossible for her to have shot them both. As the trial approached, Neil's defense team made two significant requests to the judge. First, they sought Neil's release on bail, arguing that he should return to the United Kingdom to live with his parents until the trial commenced. They also requested that all evidence collected from the Entwistle home be excluded claiming officers had entered without a search warrant. Both requests were ultimately denied. The judge ruled that officers were legally allowed to enter the home given the circumstances, and since the investigation technically began when Rachel and Lillian were found, all evidence collected was admissible during the trial. And when it's time for the trial to take place, Neil's defense did not call any witnesses, and he did not testify on his own behalf. They attempted to argue that Rachel had used the gun since her DNA was found on it. However, it was important to note that the DNA was only detected around the inside of the barrel. No DNA from Rachel was found on the gun's grip. That distinction belongs solely to Joe, his sons, and Neil. While Neil's DNA could have been left when he previously handled the gun with Joe and his sons, the critical fact remained. Rachel's DNA was absent serving as proof that she had not used the gun herself. Eventually, Neil was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder. The judge sentenced him to two life sentences without the possibility of parole. When he heard the verdict, he broke down, but quickly put on a stone-faced expression.
guilty of murder in the first degree of Lillian Entwistle. After a day and a half of deliberations, a jury found Neil Entwistle guilty of murdering his wife and infant daughter. After the sentencing, Neil's parents, Cliff and Yvonne, who still maintain their son's innocence, expressed their devastation to the press. They reiterated their belief that Rachel had killed Lillian and then taken her own life. They said, we know that our son, Neil, is innocent, and we are devastated to learn that the evidence points to Rachel murdering our grandchild and then committing suicide. I knew Rachel was depressed. Our son will now go to jail for loving, honoring, and protecting his wife's memory. When a reporter asked Cliff and Yvonne if they had ever tried to help Rachel, considering they knew about her struggles, they opted not to answer. In a similar vein, Rachel's family shared their own heartache, stating that the verdict didn't erase the pain they were enduring. In August 2008, Neil Entwistle was tricked into shaving his head, thinking it would earn him the protection of a white supremacist prison gang. Instead of safety, he was met with chilling words. It's a nice gesture on your part, but we're gonna kill you. As a result, Neil was placed in protective custody also known as Administrative Segregation, or ADSEG. By December, he was transferred to the Old Colony Correctional Center, a medium security prison in Bridgewater. Fast forward to 2016, Neil's parents still insisted their son was innocent. They argued that Neil was only guilty of wanting to protect Rachel's memory. While in prison, Neil made some pen pals and shared a new version of what happened that day. He claimed he never left the house. He was in the kitchen when he suddenly heard gunshots from upstairs. He ran up to find Rachel had shot Lillian and then saw Rachel take her own life. In 2023, Neil claimed that a juror, who was the same height as Rachel, standing at 5 feet 2 inches, violated his rights by reenacting the murder in the jury room. He argued that this reenactment wasn't following proper rules of evidence and he has been pushing for a new trial, but his request was denied once again. It was clear that Neil was a deeply troubled individual, fixated on how others perceived him. This obsession ultimately brought about his downfall. Ironically, the man who desperately sought a lavish lifestyle now finds himself behind bars, with many people agreeing that he got what he deserved. What do you think? Is he right to seek a new trial, or is it time for him to face the consequences of his actions? We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Upon arrival at the residence, the deputies noticed that the front door was open. Uh, as they approached the house, they seen uh, what they believed to be someone laying on the floor. They gave verbal commands, there was no response, uh, and at that time, um, there was a gunshot that went off. Every parent has a set way in which they want to raise their children. However, in the case of the Stockdales of Beach City, Ohio, the bizarrely strict house rules might have directly contributed to innocent people losing their lives. The strangest thing about the Stockdale family massacre is that we don't know the motive. The perpetrator has yet to mention why he did what he did, and police have been quiet on those details as well. In spite of all of that, We'll try to unpack the gruesome details of the Stockdale family massacre today. It's a case that reveals just how much darkness can be hiding beneath the surface of a seemingly happy family and how the darkness can build up and violently explode without any warning. The Stockdales were a deeply religious family that decided to move away from the city. Tim and Kathy Stockdale wanted their children to internalize wholesome Christian values and they felt like the best way to do this was to isolate their children from the real world. The family moved to a remote farm in Beach City, Ohio, where they raised their four sons, Calvin, Charles, Jacob, and James. By all accounts, Kathy was a very strict mother. She instituted a series of rules that the boys had to follow, otherwise they'd be punished, and rewarded them for following the rules with meager prizes like being able to listen to a radio show. We moved out to the farm to develop wholesome values in our children. The day we moved, we heard gunshots in our neighborhood, and I knew we had made the right decision. That's not to say that the family was completely without joy, of course. Kathy and Tim loved bluegrass music, and their children showed a lot of musical promise from a young age. Jacob especially became a fiddle-playing prodigy, 
learning how to play the instrument in an age of seven and mastering it before he hit puberty. As a result of this talent, Jacob won awards all across Ohio. He even became Ohio State Grand Fiddle Champion in 2012, a few years after a certain event that likely sowed the seeds of the homicides to come. The Stockdales eventually formed a family band with Calvin playing the banjo, Charles the mandolin, James on the upright bass, and Jacob on the fiddle, of course. Their father, Tim, fronted the band on guitar and as the main vocalist, though all of the sons sang from time to time. However, the boys didn't have much to enjoy apart from the family band. Their parents didn't allow them to watch TV, play video games, listen to most types of music, or even make friends with anyone outside of the family. Kathy saw dating as a physical danger to her children since she was worried that they might get someone pregnant and prohibited them from talking to any girls. This meant that the supposedly wholesome family was effectively a prison for all four of the children. But in the early 2000s, a TV show called Wife Swap was making waves. In the show, two families would swap wives or mothers for a few weeks. The families were usually very different from each other to highlight the diversity of family life in America and to use the tension and conflict that would inevitably occur for comedic and dramatic effect. The Stockdale boys begged their parents to participate in the show. In 2008, Kathy and Tim made the fateful decision to agree. Little did Kathy know, she just started a sequence of events that would culminate in her brutal murder. When the producers of Wife Swap saw the Stockdale way of life, they knew they had solid TV gold on their hands. They had also gotten in touch with the Tonkovich family in Illinois, who were basically the polar opposites of the Stockdales. Lori Tonkovich didn't impose any rules on her children. They would wake up whenever they wanted, wear whatever they wanted, and eat a diet consisting mostly of fast food. Needless to say, when Lori swapped places with Kathy, she was shocked by just how strict the mother of the household could be, and especially when she read about the routine the boys had to follow. After being woken up at 7.30, the boys had exactly four minutes to get to the breakfast table, otherwise they'd be fined 25 cents. They'd then perform all sorts of chores on the farm and in the house. If they completed their chores with a so-called glad heart, which is to say they didn't complain about how hard they were forced to work, they'd get tokens that they could exchange for little pleasures, like listening to a family-friendly radio show under strict supervision. You get to listen to the radio? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who something. picks those? Mom does. Oh, this is great. And this is 100 tokens, right? Yeah. And that's okay with you? I would rather not have to do the tokens to get like the radio show. Hmm. After finishing their chores, the boys gathered together for homeschooling. They couldn't even get out of the house to study, which meant they had basically no contact with other kids their age. Kathy possibly taught them a very Christian-oriented syllabus, which meant less of a focus on science and facts and more on biblical stories. During the show, Lori got so upset when she saw how the boys were living that she broke down in tears. God, I feel so sad for these kids. I'm going to take them all home with me. I asked him what he would like to do if he could do anything. And he doesn't even know. I mean, they need to know that there's other ways of doing things and then let them decide what they want to do. I didn't realize this was going to be so hard. She wanted to have a good impact on the kids' lives, so she decided to introduce them to some of the things they'd missed out on. This meant setting up a cable TV connection and buying a video game console. The boys seemed excited about the games, but Jacob notably said he didn't see any value in what he was doing. James talked about how guilty he felt, but that he still loved playing video games. This also showed just how deep the indoctrination went in the Stockdale family. When Lori encouraged Jacob to watch some TV, he reportedly broke down crying and ran outside. Lori then followed him and asked him what was wrong, and the answer she got was as shocking as it was heartbreaking. Jacob said that he was worried about going to hell if he watched TV, even though Lori was most likely showing him wholesome family-oriented content. She tried her best to change how the Stockdales lived, 
but there was no chance they'd listen. They were far too set in their ways, and the fact that Tim was there to reinforce Kathy's rules didn't help matters much. As the episode drew to a close, Kathy and Lori had very different takes on what the experience had taught them. Um, you can do things just for fun, that everything doesn't have to be written out and structured. It wasn't so bad now, was it? I have a better idea as to what I don't want my family to be. I can't think of anything here at this family that I would want to bring back. One thing anyone would notice is that Kathy had an extremely rigid personality. If she thought something was right, no one could convince her to change her mind. Even though Lori had been immersed in an environment that was so alien to her, Kathy seemed unable to even imagine a life that wasn't as regimented or controlled as the one she made her kids live. Tim's unwavering support meant that she had no one to criticize her, and there's a good chance that many, if not most, of the rules came from the family patriarch himself. By the way, I post true crime and new cases here every day, so if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing. The Stockdale's experience with Wife Swap in 2008 didn't seem to change anything, at least on the surface. Years went by, and the boys finally started leaving home and living independently. Calvin went off to Hillsdale College in Michigan, far away from his parents' influence, and started working as a teacher at the Institute. His younger brother, Charles, headed to Philadelphia to become a med student. It is important to note that the boys didn't choose to go to college in Ohio. They traveled thousands of miles away, which seemed to suggest that they were running from something or perhaps someone. This meant that by 2017, only 26-year-old Jacob and 21-year-old James were still living with their parents. They were old enough to leave, and it's intriguing that they didn't because it adds more mystery to the events that followed. Why didn't Jacob, a man in his mid-20s, just move away from the family home? There's an explanation for James deciding to stay, he was studying business at a nearby university, and he had dreams of managing the family band one day. But as for Jacob, one has to wonder why he didn't just start a life of his own. The Stockdale family band kept going, albeit without the involvement of Calvin or Charles. It became a trio and continued to perform at events across the state, amassing a decent following and even recording a few albums. <laughs> But apart from that, there was simply no reason for Jacob to stay in the tiny town of Beachview. It's possible that this was the whole problem. Jacob had nowhere to go. He might not even have known who he was. And even though he might have seemed perfectly all right on the outside, inside a sense of turmoil had started to build and it would soon erupt in a bloody explosion of violence. At around 4.36 on June 15th, 2017, Stark County Police received a 911 call that had ended with the caller suddenly hanging up. This prompted them to head to the Stockdale residence where the call had come from to investigate the suspicious occurrence. When they arrived, they heard a loud bang and rushed into the home. That's when they saw Jacob with a shotgun wound to his head. He was still alive, but barely so, and the presence of the firearm next to him meant that the wound was almost certainly self-inflicted. Police headed upstairs to continue their search, and when they entered the bathroom, they found Kathy and James lying dead on the floor, their bodies mangled by massive sprays of shotgun pellets. Tim was luckily outside of the home at the time, but he was understandably devastated when he found out. There was only one reasonable explanation for what happened. Jacob had killed his mother and brother and then tried to take his own life. However, his self-inflicted gunshot wound meant that he needed urgent medical attention. He was taken to a local hospital where doctors treated his wounds, while everyone tried to understand why he would have done such a thing. You know, it's hard to, you know, kind of surmise what the motive may have been. Um, you know, there's, there's some speculation. Um, we don't really want to get into that part of it, but, um, you know, we'll continue to investigate this case and try to determine if there's a motive. Just do not know. When Calvin found out about his mother and little brother getting murdered, he released a statement saying, James, our youngest brother, has always been a catalyst of family fun. Aside from being a gifted musician, James enjoyed dancing and had an innate love of people. James was working on a business degree and hoped to go to the business side of entertainment. He leaves behind many friends and a family that love him dearly. 
Tim also released a statement which read, Kathy has been my beloved wife of 32 years and a wonderful mother to our four sons. She loved nothing more than being a mother and grandmother. She had a strong love of learning and was passionate about her Christian faith, natural health, and organic farming. In both statements, it seemed like Tim and Calvin were intentionally avoiding mentioning their brother. In fact, the only cursory acknowledgement of what Jacob had done came from an earlier statement from Calvin in which he thanked the medical center that treated him, though he didn't mention him specifically. Jacob was seriously wounded after his suicide attempt. He lost sight in his left eye and suffered serious brain damage, which cast some doubts on whether he'd be fit to stand trial. Police decided not to charge him until he had fully recovered from his injuries, which led to over a year of uncertainty about what would happen next. On September 26, 2018, Stark County Police finally charged Jacob with two counts of first-degree murder, and his bail was set at $1 million. On October 9th, Jacob's defense attorney filed a motion to determine his competency to stand trial. Jacob pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity and was sent to Heartland Behavioral Health Hospital for observation. Jacob spent over a year at Heartland, where doctors constantly tried to test his mental competency. They held mock trials where they used legal terminology and attempted to assess if Jacob understood how the court system worked. The culprit also made two escape attempts during his stint at the Mental Health Institute. The first occurred in November of 2019 when he tried to hide behind a stack of books until he was caught. Two months later, Jacob tried blending in with a crowd of people leaving the Institute, but he was caught once again. This showed that he had enough mental competence to stand trial, but it would take more than this to convince the court. His sanity hearings were postponed multiple times due to the pandemic, and it wasn't until September of 2020 that he appeared in court via video link. For some reason, Jacob refused to respond when the judge addressed him. It's possible that he had a fear of technology due to not using a computer all of his life. Or maybe he was truly disoriented by what was happening. It's also possible that his silence was a ruse to strengthen his insanity plea. But either way, his refusal to respond in court didn't work in his favor. Doctor, are you able to hear me? First of all, officer, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I don't okay, hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Stockdale, I am uh, Judge Frank Forshoni. Do you, are you able to hear me today? Okay, he is not responding. Um, my first concern was whether they could hear and the officer standing behind him could hear. He was eventually deemed fit to stand trial by a psychologist on December 31st, 2020. The trial date was constantly pushed back due to the pandemic and behind the scenes, the Stockdale family took the opportunity to plead on Jacob's behalf. Even though he'd killed Kathy and James, the Stockdales begged the judge to give him a lenient sentence. If he was convicted, it's possible that the judge agreed as long as Jacob pleaded guilty, or perhaps there was a shift in Jacob's own mindset. Whatever the case may be, on April 28, 2021, nearly four years after he killed his family members in cold blood, Jacob pleaded guilty to both murders. The judge seemed to have agreed to the Stockdale's request for leniency, since he sentenced him to a surprisingly short 15 years for each sentence. Jacob will be eligible for parole in 2048, and from the looks of things, his family might be willing to bring him back into the fold. They've clearly forgiven him for all he's done, likely due to their commitment to Christian values. The only piece of the puzzle that's still missing is the motive. And there are several theories that might explain why Jacob killed his family members that day. Some psychologists have theorized that Kathy had a severe form of obsessive compulsive disorder. The way she regimented her kids' routines is a sign of that, and the diet she fed them might be another clue to the diagnosis. You see, Kathy never let her kids eat anything she didn't make. Even if they went out, they'd never go to a restaurant. Instead, Kathy would prepare a huge meal that they'd take with them. The Stockdales were also very big on the idea of organic foods and natural living. Jacob might have had some kind of mental illness, perhaps even OCD inherited from his mother, and a life of isolation made it far worse than it otherwise would have been. Kathy strongly believed that leisure and fun of any kind were sinful. Life was about work. Nothing was more morally righteous than keeping yourself busy throughout the day, which meant that Jacob 
had no opportunity to form his own personality. He was entirely dependent on his mother to shape his routine and tell him how to live his life, and when it comes to his desire to commit murder, there are two possibilities. The first is that Jacob simply snapped and wanted to take revenge for the perceived abuse he'd experienced at the hands of his mother. The second is that he simply wanted to escape, and since he didn't want James to go through what he'd experienced, he killed him as well. There's no way to know what was going through Jacob's mind before he pulled the trigger. He seemed like just another normal guy in his mid-twenties, up until the point he became a cold-blooded killer. On Kathy Stockdale's official YouTube channel, the last upload is of a song recorded by Jacob and James to celebrate James's 21st birthday. It's a song about the fear of growing up, and in it, James asks if there's another option. The brothers then sing a beautiful rendition of the song, Tall Buildings, which they uploaded exactly three months before one killed the other. Jacob doesn't look like a murderer in the video. If anything, it shows just how much love the brothers had, a love that might have been the feeling that drove Jacob to pull the trigger. Thank you everyone for all the birthday well wishes last week. I had a great day full of friends and good music. It doesn't get much better than that. You'd think at 21 years old I'd be ready to grow up and join adulthood. Yeah, yeah not for me. Is there a third option? I wish there was a third option. My family always said that you only felt sorry for yourself, and I didn't want to believe that because I thought, surely, he has to feel bad for killing my family. And when I heard that you felt no remorse, something changed inside of me, and I didn't know what to do with that change, and it was causing me a lot of hurt and anger because that was my closure. My closure was the hope that you would feel bad. I no longer have the desire for any closure because this is it. There's nothing left on this earth that will soothe my wounds and worries. Only God can help me now. This video depicts Cassidy Stay, the lone survivor of a massacre that occurred in Harris County, Texas, speaking directly to the man that murdered her entire family. It's a case that shocked the millions of residents of the county, 
mostly because of the absolute ruthlessness of the perpetrator. Today, we're going to unpack the sequence of events that led up to July 9, 2014, when 33-year-old Ronald Lee Haskell killed six people in cold blood. It was the kind of attack that happened with no warning, although if you look close enough, you might see the countless clues that suggested how utterly homicidal Haskell was throughout his life. But even so, he wasn't always the murderous monster that was capable of massacring a family. Once upon a time, Haskell was a normal kid just like any other. Let's peel back the curtain of time and take a look at where he came from to better understand the man he turned into. Ronald Haskell was born on the 26th of August, 1980 in San Marcos, California. His Mormon parents were very devout and closely integrated into the local religious community. Their neighbors and friends were all Mormons, which shows that the Haskells liked to stay with their own people as much as possible. One of the most respected members of the community was Tom Stay, the local bishop. The Haskells and the Stays grew quite close since there weren't all that many Mormons in Southern California at that time. The adults weren't the only ones that loved spending time with each other, though. Their children also played together endlessly, with Haskell and the bishop's son, Stephen Stay, growing closely acquainted. Stephen was five years older than Haskell, so it's possible that he acted like an older brother to him. However, everything changed when Haskell's family moved to Alaska. The sudden shock to his delicately balanced life might have had a huge impact on Haskell's mental state, but he didn't show any outward signs of it. When he graduated from Chugiak High School in Eagle River, Alaska in 1999, he was a very popular member of the student body. No one could have imagined what he'd be capable of such extreme levels of violence. In fact, most of his classmates thought of him as a funny, approachable guy and even voted him class clown in their graduation year. But Haskell wasn't just the funny kid in class. By all accounts, he was also extremely popular, becoming the prom and homecoming king during his high school career. But all of this charm was hiding something truly sinister beneath the surface. Haskell had a violent streak, one that would only come out when he had some level of power over another person. Devout Mormon men often expect strict obedience from their wives. As a result, Haskell was likely waiting to enjoy the domination that this type of relationship offered to unleash his brutal urges. Around the time Haskell was graduating high school, his childhood friend Stephen, who was 24 at the time, got married to 18-year-old Katie Lyon. Katie had a younger sister, Melanie, and they were both also part of the Mormon community that Haskell had grown up in. She was all about do, do something to better yourself every day, do something good every day, and that's what they taught their children. That's why they were such a um, strong family and why we all radiated toward or gravitated towards them, because they were always constantly trying to improve and treat everyone better every day. Stephen operated a real estate business that grew immensely successful in his Southern California home. Shortly after they got married, he and Katie had their first child, Cassidy, who'd end up being the only surviving member of the family after the massacre. Cassidy was followed by Brian in 2001, Emily in 2005, Rebecca in 2008, and young Zachary in 2010. They were a big family, but based on reports from neighbors and others that knew them, they were very happy. The business was going well, and the kids were enjoying a carefree childhood. Seeing her sister's domestic bliss, Melanie also wanted to find herself a husband. Through the Mormon community, she ended up meeting Ron Haskell and was immediately charmed by him. What she didn't know was that she was up for several years of torment at his hands. On March 15, 2002, Haskell and Melanie headed to Orange County, California to get married. The wedding took place in the home of Tom Stay with the entire community coming together to mark the occasion. The couple looked as happy as could be, but there's a chance that Haskell was already planning to exert full control over his wife's life. Haskell and Melanie stayed in Eagle River, Alaska for a couple of years. Where they stayed between 2004 and 2006 is unclear, but it's possible that they lived in California where they had plenty of friends and family. However, in 2006, Haskell made a strange decision. He might have felt like he wouldn't have the level of control over his wife that he wanted in a state like California, and it's possible that he felt like Utah, the center of the Mormon culture, would be a better fit. In July of 2006, the couple moved to Logan, Utah. Haskell didn't show any real signs of violence yet. 
It's possible that his quick temper showed in all sorts of ways, and he might have even hit his wife on a few occasions, but nothing made it into the public record. However, once he found himself in the much more conservative environment of small-town Utah, his violent urges could no longer be contained. In the summer of 2008, Haskell's mask finally slipped when he brutally beat his wife. The cause of the altercation is unknown, but whatever Melanie did, it made Haskell so uncontrollably angry that he dragged her by her hair and hit her repeatedly. The assault began in the bedroom, but when Haskell dragged her out, he ended up exposing his two children to his violence. The kids were only three and five years old at the time, but they were still old enough to recognize that something awful was happening. Melanie's injuries were severe, so much so that the police had to get involved. They charged Haskell with domestic violence, simple assault, and committing an act of violence against children. He could have gone to jail, and if he had, a lot of misery that followed a few years down the line could have been prevented. As it turns out, Haskell pleaded guilty to the assault charge, and he was given leniency for the other charges. This is the only recorded instance of Haskell hitting Melanie, but there's a lot to suggest that it was a common occurrence. In 2009, Haskell called the police saying that Melanie had run away from home. He eventually found her at a nearby hospital, and the matter concluded without further incident. However, you might ask why Melanie felt the need to run away, especially when she had young children at her home. It's possible that Haskell's treatment of her was just too much to bear. On July 8, 2013, Melanie filed a protective order against Haskell. She wanted to make her escape, which would set Haskell on the warpath. After the protective order was granted, Melanie filed for divorce in August of that year. A few months later, Melanie was given full custody of the children, with the judge ruling that any time Haskell would spend with the kids would be supervised by a psychologist who would decide whether or not he was a physical threat to them. This was a massive humiliation for Haskell. He could tell that he'd probably never again gain custody of his children, and Melanie was never going to take him back. A month after the divorce was finalized, he left Utah disgraced and moved back in with his parents in San Marcos, and a few weeks after that, he lost his job as a FedEx delivery driver. As for Melanie, she headed to Texas where her sister Katie and her family had relocated in 2012. Melanie wanted a fresh start. She wanted to be able to put the past behind her. Unfortunately, a Haskell-shaped train had already started hurtling towards her and it would destroy anything and anyone that stood in its path. In early 2014, Melanie finally made the move to Houston, getting help from her sister to get settled in. During this time, there is a strong likelihood that she was in contact with Haskell's mother. While there's no evidence of this, Haskell certainly seemed to think that they were talking behind his back because he assaulted his own mother under this belief. On July 2nd, San Marcos police received a call from Haskell's mother. She wanted a restraining order against her son after he'd brutally attacked her and provided excruciating details about the torment she'd endured. According to her statement, Haskell had beaten her up and dragged her to a computer chair where he restrained her with duct tape. He then threatened to kill her, saying that he knew that she had been in touch with his ex-wife. Haskell left his parents' home that same day and San Marcos police were unable to locate him. It was later revealed that he'd started making his way to Houston, where he possibly wanted to confront Melanie. He had no job and no prospects, so this might have been the last act of a desperate man. No one could have predicted just how far he'd go in his pursuit of his former wife. On the 9th of July, 2014, a week after assaulting his mother, Haskell was seen in Harris County. We know a few details about his movements prior to his murderous rampage, such as the fact that he went to watch 22 Jump Street in the cinema before heading to the scene of the crime. Why exactly he did this is unclear, but it seems to suggest that he'd either already planned the murders and didn't think they were a big deal, or he hadn't decided to kill anyone just yet. However, it's almost certain that Haskell had violent intentions in mind because he'd gotten his hands on the gun. Police haven't commented on the source of the weapon, but Haskell's possession of it clearly indicates that he meant business. At some point in the early afternoon, he arrived at 711 Leaflet Lane, where the Stay family resided. He knocked on the door, posing as a FedEx delivery driver, possibly wearing his old uniform to get them to open the door. 
15-year-old Cassidy was the only one home at the time, with her parents and the other kids out running errands. She answered the door and Haskell asked her where her parents were. After she told him they weren't around, he left. Moments later, he returned and informed her that he's her ex-uncle and that he wants to come inside and wait for her parents. Something felt off about this whole encounter to Cassidy. Haskell could have been giving off creepy or unsettling vibes, and she didn't want this man she didn't recognize entering her home. She tried to slam the door shut, but Haskell was a fully grown man, and he was able to overpower her. Once he forced his way inside, Haskell forced Cassidy to the floor, made her lay on her stomach, and ties her hands and feet together. He then sat and waited for Stephen and Katie to arrive along with the rest of the children. When the family came home, they were immediately held at gunpoint and made to lie in the same position as Cassidy. Haskell only wanted to know one thing, the location of his ex-wife. The Stay family refused to comply, knowing that if this man found out where Melanie was, he'd surely kill her. It's also possible that they didn't expect Haskell to follow through with his threats of shooting them. After all, this was a man that Stephen had known all his life and that Katie had known for several years as well. They'd been family not long ago. Haskell had gotten married at Stephen's childhood home. Despite all of this, when they refused to give him the location he wanted, he shot them point-blank execution style in the back of the head. He followed this up by shooting 13-year-old Brian, 9-year-old Emily, 6-year-old Rebecca, and 4-year-old Zachary the same way, along with Cassidy, who'd been tied up for hours by this point. After shooting all seven family members, Haskell drove away in their car. Police responded to the scene after receiving reports of gunfire and found that Cassidy had miraculously survived her gunshot wound. She'd managed to get her finger between the bullet and her head, and while she suffered a skull fracture and a broken fingertip, she was at least alive. Haskell had spoken about his plans before shooting the family. He intended to go to the home of Katie and Melanie's parents and kill them as well if they didn't give him what he wanted. Luckily, Cassidy was alive to tell the police about his plot, and officers across the area started looking for the suspect. Since the police knew where Haskell was headed, they got to Katie and Melanie's parents' home first and escorted them to safety. Once Haskell drove up, he saw a small army of police officers waiting for him and tried to make a getaway. He was desperate to get away, but there was nowhere to escape to anymore. It didn't take long for the police to corner him in a cul-de-sac where he exited the car and aimed the gun at his head. He threatened to take his own life if he was arrested, and a three-hour-long standoff ensued during which police called him on his cell phone. Other houses in the area were evacuated, and Haskell kept the gun pointed at his head. When officers were able to finally talk him down, he was taken in without putting up a fight. As he was being interrogated, he reportedly expressed no remorse for what he'd done. In his twisted mind, he might have thought that the killing of all of those people, four of whom were children, were justified in his hunt for his wife. The next day, the Harris County Sheriff's Office charged Haskell with six counts of capital murder and was held in custody without bond. While all of this was happening, Cassidy was released from the hospital. Her wounds were severe, her trauma even greater, but she was alive to watch the man that killed her family stand on trial. On July 11th, two days after his killing spree, Haskell appeared in court for the first time. He was wearing prison orange, his hair and beard were long and unkempt, and he didn't seem to be fully present. While the charges were being read, Haskell collapsed several times for no apparent reason. It's possible that he was shocked about the enormity of what he'd done. On the other hand, he might have been so traumatized by the fact that he'd faced justice that he couldn't take it anymore. Whatever the case may be, Haskell appeared in court several more times until his trial began in August 2019, half a decade after the Stay family was nearly wiped out. Cassidy was 20 years old by this point and therefore capable of testifying to what happened to her. She showed jurors the scar on the back of her head and told them how she had to play dead to survive the encounter. Cassidy's testimony proved crucial in convincing the jurors of Haskell's guilt. They unanimously convicted him on all counts on September 26, 2019, and prosecutors pushed for the death penalty. 
Such an extreme punishment is always a tough sell, but the judge found it appropriate given the sheer suffering Haskell had caused. Ronald Lee Haskell, uh, the jury having found you guilty of the capital murder of Stephen Stay and Katie Stay and having returned a unanimous affirmative verdict to issue number one and a unanimous negative verdict to issue number two, the court sentence you, sentences you to death by lethal injection. In the end, Cassidy was able to have the final word. As the trial drew to a close, she was allowed to take the stand one last time and read a letter she'd written to Haskell. It was a moment of catharsis, one that brought the entire tragic saga full circle. When I heard that you felt no remorse, something changed inside of me. And I didn't know what to do with that change. And it was causing me a lot of hurt and anger because that was my closure. My closure was the hope that you would feel bad. I no longer have the desire for any closure because this is it. There's nothing left on this earth that will soothe my wounds and worries. Only God can help me now. Ron Haskell is currently on death row at the Allen B. Polunsky unit, where he's awaiting his execution. He still somehow has supporters, with Judge Natalia Cornelio being asked to recuse herself from the case on October 7th, 2024, when she was suspected of being biased towards him. The long wait is torturous for Cassidy's stay and the Lyon family, and the DA's office is apparently working overtime to make sure that the sentence is carried out quickly. So what do you think of this case? Did Haskell deserve to get the death penalty? How crucial was Cassidy's testimony in ensuring he'd face justice? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Okay, 911. Broken Air 911. Hello? For most people, the safest place they could ever be is their home. And yet, for the Beaver family of Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, their home became a torture cell and execution chamber. Their screams were heard from around the neighborhood, and police only found out because one of the victims called 911 for help. The caller is clearly a child, and he's just one of many children that died that day in a brutal act of violence. No guns were used during the assault. The assailants preferred a much more intimate method of murder, so they used knives to claim the five lives that were lost that day. This is the story of the Beaver family, of the day half of its members were slaughtered like animals, and how a culture of glorifying violence contributed to their horrifying end. We're going to unpack how the perpetrators took inspiration from some of the most tragic mass killings in America and aspired to go further than any murderer had gone before. David and April Beaver weren't exactly the most normal people. In fact, there was a lot about their life that many might find strange. According to the Broken Arrow community, nothing really stood out about the Beavers, but that's not because they were an everyday family. They were more like ghosts, seldom heard from and even more rarely seen. They interact with their neighbors only when necessary and chose to homeschool each of their seven children. Their entire relationship was strikingly unusual. When they met in 1987, David was 24 years old and April was only 15 years old. The age gap didn't really get in the way of their relationship, though. They quickly settled down, and in the mid-90s, they got to work starting the big family they'd always wanted. The first child to come was Robert in 1996, followed by Michael in 1998. They became the older brothers to Crystal, Daniel, Victoria, and the baby Autumn, who was just about two years old at the time of the incident in 2015. It's possible that the Beavers started such a large family because they didn't want anything to do with the outside world. Their kids were forbidden from talking to anyone else in the neighborhood, and they spent almost all of their time at home. Their seclusion was so complete that some neighbors only found out the Beavers' family name after the incident took place. But even though the Beavers were uniquely antisocial, they weren't exactly backwards. David was a tech consultant for HP Enterprise Services, and while April was a stay-at-home mom, she regularly used Reddit under the username AOKMOM. 
Her posting history shows how deeply she loved her children, how she thought they were perfect, and that she wouldn't trade them for the world. She also spoke about wanting to live near the mountains or the ocean, and that her home state of Oklahoma didn't have either of those things. Most importantly, April talked about how she wanted her children to be tech savvy. She wanted them to learn about computers and potentially become web designers and coders someday. It's safe to say that the Beavers didn't restrict their kids from the ever-growing inflow of 21st century tech. But as it turns out, this molded their impressionable minds in unexpectedly dark ways. Since he wasn't allowed to go out much or make friends with kids in the neighborhood, Robert did what any kid growing up in the 21st century did, found a community online. Or, more accurately, he tried to find an online community. What he wanted more than anything else was to be famous, so he created a YouTube account in 2013, hoping to make it big. Salute. Hey everyone, it's me Colt Empire, in case you didn't know. You found me by accident, or you're expecting someone else. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Anyway, this is the second first ever update, which I think is a major improvement. I tried a news report theme last time. That's not very vloggy, is it? So I'm being a little more chillinated, writing stuff, scripting. I'm going to make my first skit soon. Can't show you a sneak preview or it would ruin it. It'll be like a minute long. It's, it's, it's going to be some good stuff. I think it's going to be hilarious. On this YouTube channel, Robert talked about Minecraft, his opinions on society, and his plans to make more content in the future. Notably, the last video uploaded to this channel features his little brother Michael, with whom Robert had a special bond. They spent a lot of time together, much of it on the internet where they'd go through videos and developed an obsession of sorts with spree killings and mass murders like the Columbine Massacre and the Aurora Theater shooting. Robert would later say that his parents had extreme beliefs, which, if true, might have inspired him to idolize killers. According to him, his parents were full of hatred and couldn't wait for a biblical apocalypse so that they could get retribution for everything they despised in the world. It's possible that David and April were antisocial, but Robert and Michael certainly were. Neighbors reported that they tended to behave strangely. In one incident, Michael was found staring blankly at the people next door, and he wouldn't respond when called out to. Clearly, something terrible was going on underneath the surface, and there's a chance that David made it even worse. It's been alleged that he was both physically and verbally abusive to his children, though the extent of this hasn't been verified. We do know that one of the children confirmed that David had a violent streak, which seemed to suggest that Robert and Michael potentially learned a lot from their father in that regard. But at the same time, any abuse that took place didn't explain why Robert and Michael became so obsessed with brutal violence. Regardless of the why, the two brothers soon started fantasizing about committing acts of violence. Violence. They fantasized about shooting up schools, murdering people in their own homes, and going on killing rampages across their town. According to Robert, these fantasies were just a way for him to express his internal rage. They weren't meant to be taken seriously, and they definitely weren't blueprints for what he wanted to do in real life. But as we will soon reveal, these murderous ideations weren't just flights of fancy. Before too long, they became too intense for Robert to hold in. In 2014, Robert got a job at a religious call center. His parents, both of whom were very religious themselves, were overjoyed that their son was taking such an interest in their faith. What they didn't know was that the whole point of the job was to collect funds that would help Robert act out his violent fantasies. Michael, who had always looked up to his older brother, was involved from the very beginning. They wanted to do something big, something that would be put in the history books. They wanted to make the shooters at Columbine and Sandy Hook seem like rookies in comparison. Basically, they wanted to kill as many people as possible, and they eventually settled on 50 people. However, they couldn't just go out and start murdering random citizens. They needed to practice first, so that their killing spree would live up to all they wanted it to be. They also needed weapons and ammunition, so they started gathering it the first chance they got. By the summer of 2015, Robert and Michael had Kevlar vests, helmets, guns, and bullets. Robert had saved every single penny he could from the call center job, and it paid for the personal armory that could unleash hell on Broken Arrow in the blink of an eye. Where, where, where were you going to go? I mean, where was your going to be your mass plan to get the um, most people, the most bang for your buck? We were just heading 
uh, generally towards Washington State, we've gone to Iowa to do it statewide. Did you guys have, like, like were you going to go, I mean, who else were you going to kill? Just whoever you ran into? Yeah, pretty much. We, we said five at a time, like gas stations, restaurants. Okay, and, and then, then just keep going. Yep. The final piece of their murderous puzzle was a consignment of 3,000 rounds of ammunition. It was due to arrive on July 23rd, but there was a problem. Their parents would be understandably concerned if they saw their sons receiving thousands of bullets. This was something Robert and Michael wouldn't tolerate. And so, the murder of the Beaver family was planned out for two reasons. Firstly, Robert and Michael needed to practice their craft before heading out on their real spree. And secondly, they had to make sure their parents were dead before the bullets arrived. The stage was set, and Robert and Michael were ready to put their plan into action. The perpetrators got ready to wipe out their family on July 22, 2015. Their sister, Crystal, had seen them wearing Kevlar vests and other types of body armor previously, and had told their mother about their weird behavior. However, April just told their daughter that boys will be boys, probably assuming that her sons were messing around. At around 11 p.m. on the night of the incident, Crystal got another side of her brothers wearing tactical gear when she went to their bedroom. She was likely going to ask them to wash the dishes or perform some other chore before they went to bed. But she ended up walking in on them right as they were about to execute their plan. When Michael saw her, he asked Robert if they should go ahead with the plan now. Robert said yes, and the pair immediately started stabbing and slashing at their sister with large knives. They went so far as to slit Crystal's throat, but the 13-year-old girl's will to live was too great. Since they thought she was already dead, she slowly started crawling towards the front door. As she inched to freedom, she heard her mother screaming. Robert and Michael had started attacking their parents. David suffered 28 stab wounds to the neck, torso, head, and face. It was a brutal, unrelenting assault. The kind you'd expect from a wild animal, not a human being. However, what the perpetrators did to their mother was even more gruesome. April was stabbed nearly 50 times all across her body, but that's not how she died. A medical examiner later reported that she'd been killed by blunt force trauma to the head. This means that the homicidal brothers either stabbed her relentlessly before bashing her head in or their hatred for her was so potent that they ravaged her corpse with their knives. By this point, Robert had noticed that Crystal had escaped. Her wounds were so severe that she'd collapsed outside, so Robert headed out and dragged her back in. This left a trail of blood on the driveway, something that would prove crucial later on. Who else was in the bathroom? Oh, I think... I think Victoria might have been in there. But, uh, but Victoria? Yeah, my uh, four-year-old sister. Four-year-old, okay. There's no way to know exactly what happened next, but reports confirm that seven-year-old Christopher and four-year-old Victoria were locked in the bathroom for their safety. Since they were far too young to be able to think of a plan like this, it's possible that their older brother Daniel told them to go in and lock the door behind him. He knew he had to do something anything to save his family. He didn't have time to think about why his brothers were slaughtering everyone he loved. Daniel headed to a phone as Robert dragged Crystal back into the house. Michael headed to the bathroom and knocked, asking the kids to open the door. There's a chance that Daniel had told him not to open the door for anyone, and the children did as their older brother and protector said. But Michael was the older brother too and he was laser focused on his desire to kill everyone in the house except Robert. Michael started pretending that Robert was attacking him and begged the kids to open the bathroom door. Eventually, the innocent children, probably confused and disoriented by all the chaos, opened the door. They were killed instantly, with Christopher getting stabbed 21 times and Victoria receiving 23 stab wounds. While all of this was happening, April spoke her final words, shouting at Daniel to call 911. The 12-year-old hid himself in a bedroom and called the police. And despite how shaken he was, he was able to quickly and efficiently describe the situation to the operator. Oh. Hi, where are you at? They open out Oklahoma 7411. What address? 709 Magnolia Court. Seven, okay. Are you the only one there? No. My brother's attacking my family. Your dad is attacking your family? No, my brother. Um, he has a nine day steal with me. Oh, thank you. Millions of people died. 
Okay, who's attacking your family? What? Who's attacking your family? Yes. Who, who is it? Do they have I'm over. The call ends with what sounds like pleading from Daniel. It's possible that he was pleading with Michael as he raised the knife over his head. The pleas went unanswered, and Daniel suffered 21 stab wounds before he died. Overall, the Beaver family was stabbed 150 times. The sheer physical exertion of the attack would have left Robert and Michael feeling utterly exhausted. That's when they heard the sounds of police sirens in the distance. Even though Daniel hadn't been able to provide details during the 911 call, the operator had heard enough to know that something was terribly wrong. She dispatched police officers to the scene, and when they arrived, they saw the blood that Crystal had left on the porch. They knocked on the door. Crystal, who was miraculously still alive, was able to weakly call out to the officers. They immediately broke down the door and headed inside, finding Crystal bleeding on the floor. It didn't take long for them to find the rest of the victims, along with two-year-old Autumn, who'd somehow been spared. However, her survival wasn't the result of mercy from her brothers. Later reports revealed they intended to behead her, saving her as the last course in their grotesque homicidal buffet but the police arrived before they could see their plan through. The two teen culprits fled out the back door and tried to hide in the woods behind the family home. More police arrived, and a canine unit was dispatched. The dogs caught the scent of the killers fairly quickly, and Robert and Michael were found hiding in a bush. Michael was quivering and afraid, but Robert was carrying a knife. Pictures taken of the culprits before they were booked show Michael looking absolutely miserable, but Robert has a smug smile on his face, as if this is what he'd wanted all along. Crystal was taken to the hospital where she had to undergo surgery while her brothers were taken to the police station. When he was interrogated, Robert apparently showed no signs of remorse. His interview has never been released to the public, but we do know that he talked about how he wanted to be famous and that that was the sole motive behind the mass murder. Both brothers were charged with five counts of murder in the first degree, along with an additional count of assault with intent to kill. On July 6, 2016, while awaiting trial in custody, Robert tried to commit suicide by tying his bedsheet into a noose. Perhaps he'd deluded himself into thinking this was a romantic end to his supposedly heroic quest. As it turned out, the noose was ineffective, and Robert didn't experience any injuries from the attempt. He was placed on suicide watch, and the two brothers attended their separate trials. Robert had initially pleaded not guilty to the charges. After the suicide attempt, he changed his plea to guilty, and was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. As for Michael, the judge determined that he should be tried as an adult. He initially tried to plead insanity, but he was eventually convicted on all counts as well and received a sentence of five consecutive life terms plus 28 years. The brothers were jailed in separate facilities. Robert was sent to Joseph Harp Correctional Center, whereas Michael was sent to Lexington Correctional Center. The younger culprit showed a deteriorating state of mind with inmates reporting that he made grotesque, violent drawings in crayon, possibly to make him seem tougher than he was. While in jail, Robert was diagnosed with a number of mental illnesses, many involving psychosis. Prison doctors theorized that he had major depressive disorder, borderline personality disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. They also prescribed him medication for schizophrenia. Based on how Robert has behaved in jail, all that medical attention doesn't seem to have had much of an effect. In 2019, he tried attacking prison staff with a makeshift shiv, indicating that his violent impulses haven't gone away. Crystal and Autumn, the sole survivors of the massacre, were eventually adopted by the same family. This was done to ensure they could stay together, something that might help them overcome the immense tragedy their brothers had put him through. As for the Beaver family home, it fell into a state of disrepair as it sat vacant for years. No one wanted to buy a house where something so gruesome had occurred. It became a popular spot for ghost hunters and other fans of the macabre until it was destroyed in a fire on March 18th, 2017 just weeks after the city council made plans to buy it and demolish it. The cause of the fire remains unknown, but it's possible that someone wanted to rid Broken Arrow of this tragic reminder. Two years later, 
Reflection Park was opened to honor the memory of the Beaver family. The park contains a path that goes through a seemingly innocuous patch of grass where the scene of the massacre once stood. It's highly likely that Crystal and Autumn changed their names to protect their privacy. All remnants of the Beaver family, including their home, are now gone. So, what do you think of this case? Did Michael deserve to be tried as an adult considering Robert was the mastermind? Or was he just as complicit in the murders? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. At around 4.21 p.m. on November 13, 2001, Michael Blagg called 911 to tell them his wife Jennifer and daughter Abby were missing. He claimed to have returned home to find a massive bloodstain on the bed and surrounding carpet, and Jennifer's jewelry box lying empty on the floor. The Blaggs were a beloved, highly devout family in Grand Junction, Colorado. However, further investigation revealed that not all was as it seemed. There were cracks in their veneer, and signs that Michael Blagg might have something far darker lurking under the surface. Or did he? This is a case with so many twists and turns that investigators and legal experts are still debating it to this day. It calls into question our assumption about who might or might not be a killer, how police catch them, and even the justice system itself. Today, we'll unpack this case to try to understand the chilling case of Jennifer and Abby Blagg. Jennifer Lohman was born on January 8, 1967, to parents Jean and Marilyn. Growing up in Pauls Valley, Oklahoma, it's fair to say that Jennifer loved the South, even though her childhood was far from perfect. Her father died at a very young age, and Jennifer had to make major adjustments when her stepfather, Harold Conway, came into the picture. By all accounts, Jennifer was a happy kid despite the trauma of losing her dad. She loved music, learning how to play the piano at a young age and taking an interest in sophisticated genres like jazz. Perhaps the central theme of her life, though, was her faith. Jennifer was devoutly Christian, regularly attending and even leading church groups and Bible study sessions at Ardmore High School until she graduated in 1985. However, Jennifer had suffered more trauma than anyone knew. When she was just 12 years old, a family friend that was much older than her started to take an unnatural interest in her. Some reports suggest that she was sexually assaulted by this older man, something that must have taken years for her to recover from. Despite this, she persevered and became the bright young girl everyone knew her as. After graduating from high school, she attended Oklahoma State University for a couple years before moving to San Diego, California, where she completed her bachelor's at National University. A year after she moved to sunny beaches, far to the west of her home state, she ran into someone that would change her life forever, Michael Bragg. He was a handsome Navy recruit with no shortage of charisma, and he showed an immense capacity for hard work. They were head over heels for each other from the moment they met. Michael hadn't lost a parent during his childhood, nor had he dealt with unwanted sexual advances at a young age, but he did have his fair share of struggles. His father was an Air Force colonel, which meant that the family had to move around a lot whenever he got transferred to a different air base. As a result, Michael was never really able to put down roots anywhere, but this didn't stop him from working as hard as possible to live the life he wanted. His high school grades were so exceptional that he managed to get into Georgia Tech to study nuclear engineering. During this time, he supported himself by delivering pizzas and eventually enlisting in the Navy. In 1985, Michael, who was about 25 years old at the time, got stationed in the San Diego area. It turned out that he and Jennifer had mutual friends who were dating, and they decided to set the two of them up at a beach party. Michael didn't waste any time before handing over his phone number and asking Jennifer if she'd like to go to the movies with him. Jennifer said yes, and they started going steady pretty much right after that first date. In the summer of 1991, Jennifer graduated from National University with a business degree. A few months later, on November 16th, she and Michael got married. After getting married, Michael and Jennifer moved around a lot. 
Michael was still in the Navy, and just like his father before him, he had to go wherever he was posted without a second thought. In 1995, the couple had their first and only child, Abby. There's a chance that the birth of his child convinced Michael that it was finally time to settle down. He and Jennifer had lived in Texas, California, Arizona, and South Carolina before finally settling down in Grand Junction, Colorado. Michael managed to get a job as an operations manager at Amtec Industries, and life started to go a lot more slowly for the Blags. They became members of the local church community, with Michael teaching a class at Sunday school and serving as a deacon. By 2001, Abby was six years old and had started first grade at local Book Cliff Christian School, where Jennifer worked as a teacher's assistant. On the surface, the family was pretty much perfect. They were so pious that they prayed before making any decisions and even started a new local chapter of their prayer group. Everyone saw the love they had in each other's eyes and the way they raised their child was widely praised as well. And yet, it's possible that there was more to the blags than met the eye. Michael was known to be controlling, with some saying he even had anger issues. There's also signs that cracks were forming in their otherwise perfect marriage. The move to Colorado had taken its toll, since Jennifer felt isolated in the new environment and missed the people she'd known back in South Carolina. What's more, the home they just weren't able to sell, the home they'd purchased in South Carolina, making it all the more difficult for them to make ends meet. There were also personal issues that only came to light much later. Michael sent an email to Jennifer apologizing for letting the devil take a foothold in his soul. What could this possibly mean? Was Michael stepping out on his wife? Some sources allege that Michael was a hard partier in his youth, and this was a point of contention between him and Jennifer, who never wanted to get involved in the party lifestyle. On top of that, there's reason to believe that he might have been abusive towards Jennifer. In early November 2001, Jennifer visited the offices of a lawyer in town. Some reports indicate that she claimed to have been abused by her husband and potentially wanted a divorce. However, the lawyer wasn't in just then, and according to the receptionist, Jennifer got very upset at this news, stormed out, and never came back. Whether she knew it or not, she was living her final days. In the days leading up to her disappearance, Jennifer wrote in her journal that she and Michael had fought over something. The matter appeared to be religious in nature, so it might not have had anything to do with their relationship. Even so, the timing alone makes this encounter important to consider, because there are many signs that Jennifer was thinking of leaving Michael, even if we ignore the visit to the lawyer. For one thing, she'd spoken to her friend Eddie Melson about staying with her for a little while. She'd specified that she'd bring Abby, but didn't mention Michael in the conversation. On November 12th, Jennifer was seen bringing Abby back from school. This would be the last time either of them was seen alive. The only source for details about the rest of the day is Michael, who might not be the most reliable witness, all things considered. Based on his account, Abby went to bed at around 7 p.m., and he and Jennifer slept at around 10. We know for certain that Jennifer was alive at 8 p.m. that night because she got a call from a friend asking her to go out to lunch, but beyond that, there's no telling what happened. One rather unsettling thing that happened that day was that Abby's school got a strange call from someone saying that she wouldn't come to school the next day. The caller never identified himself, and his identity remains a mystery to this day. At around 5.30 a.m. on November 13th, just three days before he and Jennifer's 10-year wedding anniversary, Michael got out of bed and went to work. Jennifer and Abby were still asleep at the time, since they usually woke up later when it was time to go to school. Michael apparently made a habit of calling Jennifer multiple times over the course of the day to check in with her, and he did so on the day of the incident as well. At around 7 a.m., possibly when he arrived at the office, Michael called home but got the answering machine which he later said wasn't unusual since Jennifer and Abby were busy getting ready for school at the time. He left a message saying, Good morning, gorgeous. It's just me calling to see how you and Abby are doing. A few hours later, he called again, leaving another message. Hey, where are you? Just calling to see how you're doing. The clock struck noon and Michael left yet another message. Hello, my beautiful bride. Hope you're having fun. You're out and about doing all kinds of cool and nifty things. And then finally, at around 3 in the afternoon, Michael left this final message. Man, where are you guys? Hey, I hope everything's okay. I love you. I miss you. And, uh... When he got home at 4 p.m., he immediately could tell that something was wrong. The house was a mess, and no matter how much he called out, neither his wife nor his daughter responded. He eventually entered the bedroom to find a gory scene. There was blood everywhere, 
and his family was nowhere to be found. Panicking and desperate, Michael called 911. Uh, I just got home from work and there's blood all over the bed and there's stuff all over the floor. My family's gone, my daughter and my wife are here. Since the culprit is usually a family member in most such cases, police immediately suspected Michael, though he was frustrated about this to no end. Did you have anything to do with their disappearance? No, I had nothing to do with their disappearance. And it's, it's strange to me to think that anybody could do anything like what apparently happened. When police searched the home, they found indications that something was wrong with Michael's version of events. For starters, when investigators searched the family van, they found traces of Jennifer's blood there. This prompted them to get a search warrant and go through Michael's computer. Upon doing so, they found thousands upon thousands of explicit images, as well as evidence that Michael had availed the services of escorts. Despite being a man of faith, Michael clearly had sexual preferences that no wife would have tolerated. It's possible that Jennifer found out about his actions and wanted to leave him, which prompted the apology email from Michael. When he was asked about the images, Michael said that Jennifer was the one who had downloaded them, apparently for educational purposes. But when pressed further, he eventually admitted that he was addicted to sexual imagery which turned out to be just the tip of the iceberg. Police later received information from a secret escort service in the area stating that Michael regularly came in to get massages from nude women. These dalliances couldn't have remained a secret for long, and Jennifer would have found out sooner or later. And then there were the fingerprints. 55 were found in the home over the course of the investigation, most of which came from either Jennifer or Michael and six of which were small enough that they could have come from Abby. However, in a strange twist, 11 fingerprints turned out to be unidentified. Could these fingerprints belong to the actual culprit? Whether or not they did, police had focused their suspicions on Michael, and they soon found out even more reasons to believe that he'd killed his wife. Over the next few months, police and volunteers combed every inch of the surrounding area. They tried looking in the Colorado River and its banks, only to find no sign of Abby or Jennifer. However, in February of 2002, police discovered that Michael had stolen $500 worth of equipment from his office. When they brought him in to ask him about it, Michael reportedly began sobbing and asked them what the average sentence was for murder, even though the police had never mentioned anything about murder. He then called for a lawyer and left without saying anything else. The next day, Michael was found in his bathtub with slit wrists. He was slowly bleeding out with a Bible, a suicide note, and a picture of Jennifer and Abby next to him. Though he was in critical condition, Michael was taken to a hospital where he managed to recover. Meanwhile, police had to wait out the cold winter months before initiating another search. They'd received a tip earlier in the year claiming that the family's minivan had been at Park Ridge roughly 10 minutes away from their residence. This prompted police to widen the search area to a 45-mile radius in April, but the 11-day search once again yielded no results. Finally, investigators decided to start searching in the only place left, local landfills. A month went by with no luck. But then, on the 4th of June, they made a grisly discovery. Diggers found what looked like a black and white tent, but as they extracted it, it tore from the side and a rotting leg dropped out of it. This leg belonged to none other than Jennifer Blagg, who'd been buried under a mountain of trash with a bullet still in her head. Forensic analysis revealed that she still had a retainer in. This suggested that she was in bed at the time of her death, since that was the only time she used her retainer. Hours later, Michael Blagg was arrested and charged with murder in the first degree. Though investigators continued to search for Abby, they didn't manage to find her body and she was presumed dead. In March of 2004, Blagg's trial finally got underway after many months of delay. He was charged with not just murder, but also two counts of theft and one count of abusing a corpse. Since Abby's body was never found, prosecutors weren't able to charge him with her death. It's for this reason that they took the death penalty off the table as well. During the trial, prosecutors alleged that Blagg had killed his wife because she was thinking of leaving him, likely after finding out about his collection of explicit images and his regular trips to brothels. 
In their version of events, he staged a robbery after murdering Jennifer to cover his tracks. Michael's defense argued that there was no murder weapon, and that prosecutors were targeting Blagg because they didn't have any other suspects. They also pointed to the fact that there was no real motive for Blagg to kill his wife. In the end, the jury took 12 hours to deliver the verdict. Verdict forms are in proper form and order, and I will read those which bear the four person's signature. As to count one, we the jury find the defendant, Michael Blagg, guilty of first degree murder. Count two, we the jury find the defendant, Michael Blagg, guilty of theft, victim, United Services Automobile Association. Count three, we the jury find the defendant, Michael Blagg, guilty of theft, victim, Amatek Dixon, and Aero Electronics. Count four, Michael was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, but the story wasn't over yet. His lawyers filed numerous appeals, until finally, in 2004, they discovered that one of the jurors, Marilyn Charlesworth, had lied on her questionnaire. She'd been the victim of domestic abuse, something that she hadn't admitted to, which disqualified her from being a juror on the case. As a result, the conviction was thrown out and a new trial began. This time around, Michael's defense attorneys pointed to the fact that he'd been interrogated and grilled for 10 hours without a lawyer present, and the police seemed convinced from the start that he was the real culprit. The defense also stated that there was a registered sex offender, referred to only as Mr. B. This person was a resident of Montana and a search warrant had apparently led police to a note that contained a list of victims. Abby was one of the names on the list. It seemed like Blagg had a second chance here, but it just wasn't meant to be. On April 5th, 2018, Blagg was convicted by a second jury on all counts, and his sentence was once again life without parole. Blagg is currently incarcerated at the Colorado Territorial Correctional Facility in Cannon City. His appeal was denied in 2023, and the conviction and sentence were upheld. Even so, many wonder if justice was truly served here. There are many unanswered questions, such as the time of the crime. Jennifer was asleep when she died. Does this mean that Blagg had killed her before heading to work? If so, did he leave all those messages to cover his tracks? And what about Abby? If he wanted Jennifer dead because of his failing marriage, why would he try to kill his own daughter? Finally, there's the question of the mystery fingerprints. Did they come from Mr. B? Was this just a ploy from the defense? And if so, is the real killer of Jennifer and Abby Blagg still walking out there? On the other hand, it's possible that justice was served here. Blagg had a motive, and the jury convicted him based on evidence both times. Either way, Jennifer's family now has to live with the immense loss, and Abby's fate still remains a mystery. So, what do you think of this case? Do you think Michael Blagg actually murdered his wife and child, or was he unfairly convicted in both trials? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. If you like the way we create these videos, and you want to help bring more cases like this to light, hit that like button and subscribe for more deep dives. Thank you once again for watching.